Hello, this is Mike. In this screencast, I want to look at the extent to which social media channels have become an integral part of our everyday lives. And I want to do this by uh, illustrating some simple demographic data around usage patterns on four channels in particular, four we're probably all very familiar with and probably using Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube. To place this in context, try to think about a day in your own life, a typical day. Like me, you possibly wake up on a morning and one of the first things you do, perhaps before even getting out of bed or finishing breakfast, is reach for your smartphone. Maybe there's a couple of emails waiting, you want to check a status update on Facebook or Twitter, that type of thing. You want to start connecting yourself to the outside world. Before you even reach the office or school, you're potentially already exchanging messages perhaps with friends all over the globe, catching up on the latest news, and throughout the day receiving key feeds of interest to you. Even towards the end of the day, well, how many dinner parties have been interrupted by uh, the familiar image of a couple arguing about someone constantly on their phone, maybe text messages in the past. Today, it's more likely to be they're on Facebook, LinkedIn, something like that. And even in bed, most of us, the book at bedtime has kind of vanished and been replaced by the, the iPad or other tablet device and again, probably a check of our Facebook pages. So from dawn to dusk, individuals are constantly connected to each other, potentially on a global scale, through social media channels. And it's important because this provides an opportunity for businesses to engage pretty much 24 seven. But the engagement can happen positively and negatively too. So I wanna think about some of those things towards the end of this screencast. But let's begin with a look at a straightforward channel Twitter. Twitter is very straightforward to me. It's a nice, simple channel, and that explains its near ubiquitous nature. 150 characters of text maximum, so messages are quick and succinct, concise. You can post links, photographs, all sorts of things. Very, very simple to use, and generally from a mobile device these days. So in many contexts, it's replacing uh, straightforward text messages of the past and a number of indeed universities are now replacing traditional email with Twitter accounts because it's a quicker and easier way to communicate with their students. Twitter is global. Um, there are countries where it's blocked of course such as China, areas of the Middle East but on the whole, massive connectivity. Over 100 million users in the US, for instance, 24 million in the UK. So it's part of what we do, it's part of what we carry in our pockets. And the people who use Twitter, very interesting profile. Like most social media channels, the split between females and males is 60-40. So generally speaking, on most channels, women have a slight dominance. Twitter has become popular with uh, higher educated, higher earners. 83% of Twitter users are graduates, for instance. 47% earn over 35,000 a year. This reflects the transition from Twitter in the early days where what are you up to? I'm eating a cheese sandwich has been replaced by quite sophisticated marketing and networking activities. And so that's, in a sense, changed the demographic of the people using it for more professionals on Twitter now. Generally speaking, about almost 60% are in the over 30s bracket. Younger users are using uh, Twitter, but uh, traditionally they either prefer other channels or stick to traditional SMS and MMS messaging. So it, again, the age reflects the professional profile of the typical user. Interestingly, 60% access globally is via mobile devices such as your smartphone or tablet. Eight out of 10 people access the system that way here in the UK. So it's a very much a, a portable, simple communications medium. And, you know, I've used it in all sorts of contexts. When I was stuck in an airline queue because of endless delays, I tweeted the company. Miraculously, I had a direct message back. Within a couple of seconds, 
Then within two minutes, I'd been phoned back. Someone had plucked me out of the queue and helped me catch my connecting flight. So it, it's almost replacing the telephone in some context. A lot of users are still quite passive. Um, they follow information services, for example. So uh, I subscribe to a couple of favorite weather forecasters, for example, and I receive regular updates on weather conditions via Twitter. A lot of people just use Twitter that way. 40% have never sent a tw single tweet, but on the whole, it's a very active medium. Although it's seen as something much more sophisticated, Facebook is really just an extension. And if you look at them stylistically, the, the differences between Twitter and Facebook are becoming more and more blurred. Twitter is still kind of an enhanced microblog. Uh, 150 character limit has been replaced by something akin to 500 for a status update. And of course, you can have live one-to-one -one messaging. You can post and share photographs, videos. And it's kind of become very much I'd say the most social of the platforms available. If Twitter is uh, near ubiquitous, Facebook almost completely ubiquitous in the countries it operates. The proportions of the population who have a Facebook account, whether they're active daily users or not, it's another matter, but the proportion is quite high. It, across the EU, over 200 million people are regularly signing into their Facebook accounts, almost as many in the North, in North America, uh, and even in territories such as the Middle East, 20 million users is, is very impressive in relatively short space of time. Over 850 million active users now, in fact. Facebook has a similar profile to Twitter too. Uh, predominantly graduates, slightly more women than men. Uh, over half of uh, users are in the higher income bracket. There's a lot of discussion at the time I'm recording this about whether young people are deserting Facebook because the proportions seem to be changing. It's true there are more channels now, and some of them are more appealing to younger users. But I think the case that it's becoming the old person's channel is greatly exaggerated. 46% of users at the time of recording this uh, over 45. And actually, the changes in ages that we're seeing among Facebook usage reflects the broader population. You know, we're, in, we're an aging society as well as an always-on society. And so what we're seeing is, is just typical demographic change. Again, portability is the key. About half of all Facebook users are not uh, accessing the medium via their computer. It's cell phones predominantly, and 8 out of 10 users in Japan um, are looking at using smartphones and tablets to access the channel. So very, very similar passage, patterns of usage to Twitter. LinkedIn, this is often seen as the professional person's Facebook. I completely disagree with that. The way it's used is entirely different. But this is more about uh, developing a professional profile and engaging in professional networking. So it's quite different. Through LinkedIn, you can advertise your own CV, you can recruit talent, you can recommend people within your business network, you can set up groups and form communities of practice. It's very, very much a, a professional channel. And although not as big as the others, it's gaining ground very quickly. 58 million users in the US, for example, eight here in the UK. The typical profile of a LinkedIn user, it's just the only one that is roughly 50-50 male, female, uh, a slightly higher proportion of graduates, and almost three quarters in the higher income, 35,000 a year bracket. This, to me, greatly reflects uh, the professional usage rather than the personal social usage and the fact that we're using it as an integral part of their careers. You know, research recently published on the British Psychological Society's blog uh, demonstrated very clearly that we're often more honest on our LinkedIn profiles than we are on our CVs. Interesting, isn't it? Uh, so this reflects the, the patterns of usage and it's become the preferred way of checking people out. Again, um, the age 
uh, parameters reflect the professional usage, 8 out of 10 users and rising are over 35. So it's, it's the corporate dimension that's important here. 44% of companies with more than 10,000 employees have a formal profile on LinkedIn. In fact, there are over 2 million and rapidly rising company profiles to be found there. So you can check out organizations as well as individuals within them. And finally, the, of the four I want to take a quick look at, there's YouTube. YouTube is fantastic and in fact a lot of what I'm doing right now is being moderated by YouTube. It's a broadcast medium. For the first time ever, we're all able to become TV and radio broadcasters with a straightforward broadband connection, simple webcam and a mic. That's all you need. Here we can post videos, audio files, pictures, we can comment on them, we can engage in discussion. Um, so it's fantastic. You can set up literally your own TV station in your office or bedroom simply by having a YouTube account and basic technology. Less than 30% of the traffic is in the US. It's a very much a global networking tool. There are over 60 languages, for instance, to be found on a simple YouTube search. And there are local versions in over 43 countries now. 350 million devices worldwide have a YouTube app of some kind installed within them. And indeed, one in five uh, videos are viewed by a smartphone or tablet rather than the traditional computer. Indeed, from mobile devices alone, over three hours of footage is being uploaded every single minute. So people really are embracing the democratization of information and the ability to become broadcasters. And from a business point of view, YouTube has massive potential. Of course, there's a downside to all of these things and I just want to flag up a cautionary note. I'm talking quite positively about the benefits of social media in this screencast, but we need to remember that there is also uh, a darker side to all social media channels. As Domino's Pizza Company found out, for example, you only need a couple of rogue chefs contaminating food and posting what they think are humorous videos onto YouTube, and you can have massive instant damage to your brand that needs equally rapid response if you're going to recover. Anyone involved in service industries will know that customers, in particular disgruntled customers, are happily embracing this open access to publishing in one form or another. And from cell phone networks to utility companies, there are sites of just people complaining about stuff out there. Again, if they get a lot of traffic, they're going to come up high in Google and other search engines when people are looking for your brand or product. So you've got to be very, very careful of that. And as United Airlines found when uh, they accidentally broke a guitar belonging to Canadian musician Dave Carroll, his, his simple revenge when he didn't get satisfaction was very straightforward. He recorded a really entertaining song about how United break guitars. Uh, it went viral very quickly and he got his message across far more effectively and far more globally than a simple letter of complaint about a broken guitar would have done. So there are opportunities for business, but remember all of our customers are using these tools too. And so it's very, very simple to be caught out if we don't engage and monitor social media very effectively. It is part of our everyday lives. And that to me is the main takeaway from this screencast. We belong to an always-on society, from waking up to going to bed to the middle of the night when the phone goes ding and you just can't resist looking at it. It's integral to everything we do. And as we've seen from the demographic data just on four channels that we're all familiar with, it's massive. And the social media population, this is my key takeaway, typically matches the population as a whole. Thank you.